Welcome, Gabor. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. It's good to be back with you guys. Well, it's a, it's a big day uh, today, uh, publication day for your new book. Yes, today is the day after 10 years of research and two and a half years of writing and umpteen hours of suffering. Here we are. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, you, you just asked you. a good question that I think we should start with, which is what do we think about the book? I think that's yeah, a great yeah. well, starting place. What you, guys, what you guys want us to think about it, yeah. You want me to start there, Will? Go ahead, Keith. Okay. Um, I really enjoy, you know, I've read all your books and I've really enjoyed this particular book. Um, I felt like you did something um, a little different than what's been done, which is you really brought together so much research to support the understanding of why we need to focus on trauma. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a really craft, like a, a really craftful, like thought out way that it, it, it flowed really beautifully. Um, so I, I, I was very touched by the book and, uh, yeah, moved by it. And I think this is going to be a really important read for a lot of people about culture, uh, mm -hmm. and under, to gain a deeper understanding of how did we get here and mm -hmm. what do we do about it? Uh, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed it and I'm excited for it, for it to come out. Thank you. Yeah. How about you, Will? Yeah. Um, Gabor, I, it's, it's interesting to hear you say, you know, 10 years of research, cause I was telling Keith, uh, I think it was yesterday. This must've been 10 years of research to uh, put all this together. It's, it's truly a, a tour de force. And I see elements of in the realm of hungry ghosts and when the body says no and hold on to your kids and, and so much of your work coming together in just this, uh, massive synthesis. Uh, it's very beautiful. So, uh, congratulations and, and thank you for putting well, thank this you. out. Thank you. Well, you know, if you can believe this, I collected 25,000 articles, uh, newspaper reports, scientific papers, medical journal uh, reports, all collated under different subjects, cataloged, you know, a um, couple of hundred interviews, um, including yourself, Will, you know, and, and uh, two or three hundred books that were read and annotated, you know, and, and then all of that had to be brought together into this all these interviews had to be, you know, um, transcribed and then read, and, and it, was, it, it was enormous, you know. And for a long time, I I didn't think I was up to it actually. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, yeah. uh, but it, I mean, definitely the book reflects that hard work for sure. I mean, mm. you know, it's it's just, but and it's also it doesn't read with the amount of research you put into it. Um, it yeah. it doesn't read obviously like a like uh the scientific paper which is nice yeah. Yeah. um you know it, it's very approachable uh and 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 to have that much research in a book that's that approachable i mean i i, I just say job well done it's really wonderful well that, so that you can thank my editors for uh who uh -huh. are very, who are very vigilant on on behalf of the reader that we don't fatigue them with too much scientific gobbledygook and also to my co-writer's son who really knows how to lighten things up and to put mm. them in a very reader friendly terms so um it was a group effort really and uh I, mm. in the end i was very happy with it well i thought a, a good um leap is to talk about the title yeah uh a, as a kind of jumping off point of the myth of normal and to maybe um you know you spent a lot of time in the book really kind of expanding on the concept of Here's what we call illness. Here's what we call normal. Um, and, and so I, I think a great place to start would be like, can you talk about sort of the, the fallacy of normal and what we're saying is normal and why maybe normal isn't the thing to strive for actually? Uh, and then yeah. what the, the whole, how the whole medical paradigm has been set up around this. Sure. So within the medical paradigm, there's a very legitimate use of the word normal. So that within outside certain biophysiological parameters, you can't sustain human life, you know, outside of a certain temperature, too high or too low, certain blood acidity, certain blood pressure, for example, there's no life. So in that sense, normal reflects what's natural and healthy. 
But we've extrapolated that meaning and applied it to our daily experience. And we think that whatever happens regularly and often enough is normal. So that we've confused norm with healthy and natural. But I'm arguing that in this culture, what is actually normal in that sense is neither healthy nor natural. In fact, I think it's pathological, which also means but so the, our way of life, how we raise children, how we gestate children, how we give birth to children, how we raise them, how we work, uh, the values that we live by, our consumer culture, the whole ep- ethic, the capitalist ethic that people are born selfish, greedy, uh, aggressive, competitive, and uh, individualistic, uh, th- these these normalities, I think are actually totally abnormal when it comes to genuine human needs, which also means that when we see pathology of mind or body, then we call these people abnormal. No, what they're responding, what, what, what they're exhibiting is a normal response to abnormal circumstances. So that depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, psychosis, what do you want to call it, or autoimmune disease or malignancy, are actually normal responses to abnormal circumstances in many, many cases. So the myth of normal then refers to the uh, belief that the way we're living is normal, and also to the belief that abnormalities are when this pathology happens. And then furthermore, there's a third layer to this normality, which is that then we assume that those that are not well are abnormal and the rest of us are. And I'm saying it's not like that. I think there's a whole spectrum that very few of us are not on the spectrum of some degree of trauma-inflected uh, suffering. One of the things that you and I have talked about a lot over the years, Gabor, is the trauma of medical training. And yeah. your book kind of opened my eyes to a deeper layer of um, not just how that system operates, which I'm very familiar with, uh, but what underlies uh, how that system operates or where that system arose out of. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, your perspective there on how, what we're training into doctors um, and and for that matter, any helping profession, any, you know, therapists, physicians, nurses, um, what are trainees up against um, and where does that come from? Well, I, I mean, as you recall, or maybe you haven't got to the last chapter, but you quoted in the last chapter well, where you say that medical students or medical residents are killing themselves. Right. Well, they're not killing themselves. They're being killed by their compliance with the system. And, um, uh, there was a study done that I cite early in a book on telomeres, telomeres being these <clears throat> chromosomal markers, let's say, of stress and aging. And when they looked at the telomeres of medical residents or students, they aged faster than those other people their age, going to the stress on medical people. And somebody once said to me, how do you build a cult where you isolate people from their normal lives and their families, you give them a uniform, you give them a jargon that only they can understand, you put them under authority and leaders, then you deprive them of sleep. That's how you create a cult. In other words, you send them to medical school, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, medical school, a lot to, I talked to a lot of doctors, and uh, they talked about how stressful it was, how ashamed they were, how they were made to feel shame, if they didn't, if they weren't up to the mark, or if they tried to be human, they were um, ostracized for it. I talk about my friend Lisa Rankin, who was an obstetrical resident, had a night where four babies died when she four babies died in one night. When she cried in the doctor's room, she was criticized for it. All right. I talked to Jeff Rediger, who was a psychiatrist at Harvard, who said that when he was a medical resident, he had a baby born with some abnormality or some pathology would have been an infant ICU for six weeks. He wasn't given one day to visit with him. And then who goes into medical school? To speak for myself, and you guys can tell me if you fit the category, but very driven people really willing to pull up with a lot in order to get through. Uh, uh, for me, it, was, it wasn't just a calling to become a doctor. 
which is legitimate. I want to help people. I want to have some scientific understanding of the human physiology and the human mind. Those are all great motivations, but I was also driven by my need to be important and my need to be an expert and all that. Now, to the extent that we're driven, uh, we're not in charge. And so right. I think that the, the kind of people that they recruit for medical school, now, in order to get to medical school, I had to study calculus and I had to get a really high mark in calculus. Now, I have very little aptitude for that. I mean, I could do it because I'm smart enough. So I got 95% in calculus. Two weeks later, I couldn't have told you what calculus was about. Well, what was that all about? It wasn't about anything I needed for medical school. Nobody ever asked me to calculus in medical school. It wasn't necessary. It was to prove that I can jump through the hoop. Right. So, so much of the selection, the self-selection and selection in the training of medical schools is traumatizing. And then, of course, just to finish this, nobody talks to you about trauma, either of you or anybody else's. So then there we are, a bunch of traumatized people who don't understand trauma, and then they face a population, all of whom are traumatized, as if they weren't traumatized, they wouldn't be in your office. So whether they come in with depression, anxiety, psychosis, bipolar, ADHD, or even they come in with autoimmune disease, they're there because of trauma. But you have no way of recognizing it, and you haven't dealt with your own. So then you're further up against the frustration of you dealing with stuff that you can only play with the surface. You can only affect symptoms, and you can't deal with the underlying dynamics. Oh, boy, I could go on, but I'll stop here. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that about you in calculus. I um, Calculus was my biggest enemy. Uh, yeah. I, I almost couldn't do it uh, to, yeah. to jump the, the hoop, but I, um, I guess I've, I've often wondered... Uh, on the flip side of medical training, if I would have even wanted to go to medical school, if I had done the trauma healing that I've done mm -hmm. in the last 20 years before mm -hmm. uh, considering it, I don't think I would have. So in some ways, I'm grateful that I have the privilege with the status of you know being a physician to help other people with trauma, that it would have been harder for me to have that influence uh well, if i uh, had not that, been dissociated in medical school yeah but that, that's true but i also think it's possible to arrive at this calling as a calling because you are an intelligent sentient compassionate being who wants a profession where you can apply your knowledge to alleviate suffering in the world and and that means you just be a great physician you know so, yeah, it's true. If, when you work with your own trauma, you learn a lot, and then you can apply that. But I, I don't think you necessarily need that to start with. I think it's possible to arrive at this great calling of medicine in a more open, more open-minded and self-aware way. And once you're self-aware and you have self-compassion, that compassion will teach you about other people's trauma. It'll, it'll teach you how to work with them. So, you, you know, yes, it's true. We go through this and we learn a lot, but I don't think it's the only way of learning. And, well, and, like, and, and the yeah. other side of it, if I may say, well, most of our colleagues never do learn. They just get traumatized and they complete to inflict their traumas on their clients or they can continue not to understand the traumas of their clients. Well, I would also think that the traumas that we will already have experienced prior to our training Mm -hmm. is enough to learn from. We don't necessarily need extra <laughs> trauma to yeah. learn more, <laughs> right? That's right. Well, That's well right. Let, me, let me take that a little further with you. So, you know, you talk a lot about trauma, obviously, and, and trauma is becoming a very, I think this language and these frameworks of understanding the nervous system and, and psychology that, that's arising more in recent decades has, has become, can become very helpful. Um, yeah. Uh, and you talk in the book about obviously like big T's, little T's and sustained little T's. And can you say a little more about, um, first of all, how are, are most people working through trauma at, you know, yeah. in their system? Like, is that just a part of the journey? We don't get away from that. And then, and then the second part of this question is going to be, how are we doing in terms of the arc of, humanity here are we are you saying in this book that you think we're getting more traumatized now as 
a species or I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, I couldn't quite tell what you were saying in the book about that, but it seems like you're pointing to something there. Great questions. But before I get there, let me just jump on an idea that you threw in there in the beginning. What if in our medical school training, as you say, we're already traumatized. What if in our medical school training, that was actually part of the curriculum in learning about our own traumas and how to deal with them? I mean, that would radically yeah, change the path. That would radically. Oh, well, it that's radically, obviously what we're trying to do in IPI is to re-educate. Yeah. It would be great exactly. if we people caught everyone earlier. Exactly. And, it's and true. Really, and what you're doing through your program is you're basically compensating for what people didn't get uh, in, yeah. in medical school. So what if well, we, we actually yeah. got it, you know? So, yeah. Now, as to your question, the two-part question, um, I think in this society, if you understand the actual meaning of trauma, um, most people are, suffer from some degree of it, and to the degree that we suffer from it without recognizing it, we're working from it, but we're not working through it. In other words, we're operating from a, a template of trauma, but we're not aware of it. I mean, I was like that much of my life. So the, yeah, I was traumatized, but I didn't know it, and, and and I was operating from it. It was my operating system without me knowing that it was my operating system. But it's affecting how I related to my work, my work calls, and related to how I relate to myself, to my spouse, to my children. You know, so until we understand it and work it through, we're working from it unwittingly with negative impact on ourselves and and on other people. Um, and trauma being not what happens to us, but what happens inside of us. So trauma, the, the meaning is, is a Greek word for wound or wounding. So the wounding is what happens inside of us. The wounding is not the fact that somebody hits me on the head. The wound is the concussion that I suffer. So that, so that the wound is what happens inside of us. Which is a good thing. Because... If it's a wound that's inside me, then it can be healed. If it was the event that happened all those years ago, that'll never change. So the trauma wasn't that somebody abused you. The trauma was that as a result of being abused, you developed a shame-based, fear-based view of yourself and the world. And you constricted yourself and you disconnected from your body in order not to feel. That's what the trauma is. Now, where the world, the world is going with this, well, there's two ways you can traumatize. Let me rephrase it and ask you. The, there's two ways you can hurt people. Two basic ways. One is you can do bad things to them. You can abuse them emotionally, physically, sexually, racially, and so on. You can deprive them of um, you know, proper nutrition proper housing, and so on. You can subject them to racism. So that's when we can wound people. But you can also wound people by not meeting their needs. Human beings, we're not tabula rasa as human beings. We're not empty slates that you can just write anything on. We do come into this world with certain needs, with certain requirements, physio physical as much, and, and, and at least as much as physical, emotional ones. And the more those you're deprived of those needs, the more hurt you're going to be. So if you look at what's happening with our kids, I mean, you guys as psychiatrists, you may have seen this article in the New York Times two weeks before now, I think, or three weeks ago, this teenager on 10 different psychiatric medications. I did see that. Yeah. yeah. Not and uncommon. No, it's not uncommon. Well, what's happening? is that children's needs are massively frustrated. Then they act that out in terms of mental health challenges and behavior problems, and then we medicate the hell out of them to deal with the symptoms. So to answer your question, Keith, this world is increasingly traumatizing by its escalating deprivation of human needs for healthy development and the stress that it imposes on people. I mean, if you look at what triggers stress being the three uh, major instigators of physiological stress, uncertainty, lack of control, lack of control and conflict. Well, what characterizes the modern world better than those three words? So people are increasingly stressed, which means that their parenting is increasingly stressed. Children are increasingly deprived of their needs. The parents are increasingly under 
extreme strain, this world is getting worse right now, as far as I'm concerned. This is, to look at it culturally or historically, this is a system in decline. And a system in decline puts heavy pressure on its, uh, on its members. Yeah, and Gabor, would you say that the the this um, increase <clears throat> in uh, traumatization currently is that simply a symptom of developing systems, which are the foundation of which is based on the the deprivation of these needs and uh, and, and all of what results from that? In other words, the the construction of a um, Resma Menachem has said, you know, that we, we call wounding, um, we, we can turn wounding into something that we call culture. Yeah. When well, it, that's, I think when it becomes structural, I think it is structural right now. I mean, one could give some, some simple examples of it. Um, um, let's say something basic like food. Okay. There are huge corporations who scientifically research how to create the unhealthiest foods for people with the biggest, what they call sweet spot factor, where they, the most, the combination of fat, sugar, and salt, that's going to get more people hooked on this food, terrible for their health. It'll kill them, or hey, it'll bring a lot of profit. Now, these people are respectable philanthropists, pillars of society, and contributors to the major political parties. That's a structural aspect of this system. At this point, only the most inveterate denier would question the reality of climate change. But... The warnings have been coming for many, many decades. You know when the first warning for climate change was given? The year 1900, the year 1800. <laughs> That's how far it goes back. Alexander von Humboldt, a, a, a German naturalist and geographer, and he, he saw the impact of climate change in, in Venezuela. And, um, but it's been coming with increasing frequency for decades and decades. Structural to the system is denial of climate change and institution of policies that, that keeps it going. That's structural. Um, yeah, and there's... Um, so there's so, so many ways, so, so many ways that the things that hurt people are structural to the system. And then there's this other arc that adds to these structural complexities that are uh, making it challenging. Yeah. Where, where culture is established is this arc of technology that on one hand we could say is improving lives and you know offering um, more opportunity to the masses uh, and then on the other hand you, you speak to this a little in the book we have um, technology offering feeding more of these uh, dopamine reward, circuits mm -hmm. um so you know you basically have a slot machine in your hand now looking for intermittent reward on your phone and you're basically playing a slot machine all day long now in right. your hand where right. you're getting your particular fix that's better than the coin that would come out of that slot machine you're looking for your thing in social media and yeah. so I, i'm curious about this we have this arc right of technology that's actually really cool to be alive during yeah. But then it's adding a very serious complexity to maintaining um to maintaining uh sanity and, and not getting into sort of an internal chemical imbalance from all the this drive. And you speak to this a little in your book. Do you want to just kind sure. of elucidate on that a little bit? Sure. Well the very fact that the three of us are able to be together uh from totally disparate places and have its conversation and then it'll be seen by many people, you know, who knows in how many different places in the world. That's a terrific uh, achievement of technology, you know. So how, how can one gain say that? 
uh, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, technology is in itself is always neutral. It's a question of who's using it for what purpose. And uh, this technology was never designed for the many of the purposes that it's used for. It was designed basically for communication and the sharing of information. That was the information highway. That was the whole idea of the internet. That was assuming that people were using it maturely and for benign purposes. But the same te that same te technology can be used for immaturely, uh, impulsively, and for purposes that are the very opposite of benign, such as the one you described, where they create cell phones and games to make people addicted. And they call that neuro neural marketing they call it neural marketing where they tap into the nervous system in a way to make it more hooked more addicted and they use the latest technology and neuroscience to to create products whose des whose design is nefariously dedicated to enhancing the addiction process let alone the fact that a lot of immature creatures are not using the internet it wasn't designed for them so that um in a world that deprives people of meaning, which it does, deprives people of a sense of belonging and of attachment, a lot of people will be using the technology to try and get their attachment needs met. So now we have Facebook. Now, Facebook is interesting. What is the name? Facebook. It's the face that you present to the world. It's not really you. It's the, you're showing your face to the world. And you want to be liked. And you want friends. Those are attachment dynamics. So the technology has replaced genuine human-to-human -human attachment dynamics in a way that leaves more pe people more empty than before. So there's all these studies that the more kids use the internet, the less healthy they are emotionally, let alone we know that excessive use of the digital technology actually interferes with the development of essential brain circuits. And I quote that, those studies in the book. So... Let's acknowledge the immense positivity. I mean, my work is now known all over the world simply because of this technology. It wouldn't be otherwise. If it was only for my, based on my books, I'd be known, but not to the extent, not nearly. You couldn't do this teaching that you're doing without the technology, the, 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 the psychiatric uh, education that you have created and enrolled so many people, and you couldn't do it without the technology. But I want to say something heretical, which is if I could snap my fingers and for all its advantages, if I had to compare the advantages with the harm, if I could snap a finger, I'd get rid of it all. Hmm. I think the overall impact is negative. That's my personal view on, on the development of human beings and our children. I think it's especially true with teenagers and, and children. Um, <clears throat> I watched my now 20 year old daughter grow up in sort of the first generation of Snapchat and Instagram and, and these social media platforms. And in particular, Snapchat, um, seemed to me, you know, exquisitely designed for cyber bullying and yeah. getting away with a disappearing message after you've, uh, cast a stone at someone in a way that, uh, in, ordinary reality and physical face-to-face -face reality would never uh, stand, right? There would yes. be, there would be consequences. So, yes. and it's, it's very disturbing. You, you mentioned in the book um, that executives from social media companies are not allowing their children to use uh, iPads. Um, That's right. Steve Jobs, <laughs> for example. Um, and so what, what's coming to mind for me is this issue you brought up a few minutes ago of maturity and how do we how do we actually handle a tool it's like holding a scalpel at the wrong end of the of the tool and we're we're hurting ourselves right and um how well, if, you're, if you're raising kids if you're a carpenter if you're raising kids you would not put a electric drill in the hands of a two-year-old you just wouldn't do it right um, you would mentor them, and, 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 and your mentoring of them would be very much based on the quality of your relationship with them. If they wanted to connect with you, they'll want to learn from you, and they'll want to respect you. Now, if you, once you've got that relationship, you can introduce 
whatever you think is appropriate, when you think it's appropriate, not a moment before, but once you introduce it, you know that you can ben- beneficially influence how they use that technology, how they use that particular right. modality. Well, no, we give these kids this, these tools. It's, it's like, literally, it's like putting a power drill in the hands of a two-year-old. Right. And in some ways worse because the power tool they'll feel hurt by very directly. Yeah. And it's much more uh, inconspicuous and, and confusing about the ways people are being hurt. It's much more insidious. Right? Yeah. It's much more insidious. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Well, this, th- this kind of moves me into, you know, we started with like this kind of, said flippantly about, well, you don't need an extra layer in the medical school of going through trauma, you already have trauma. And, and so we have all this, we're relating to very complex elements right now of technology and, and, and culture that obviously could be very toxic to our systems if we're not aware. But then there's also the conversation of everything that became before us that we're relating to also. Um, so there's the present stuff that's very new in history, obviously. Um, you know, tech, this type of technology is very recent, right? And we're, we're in it right now. Um, and then pre the technological revolution, we're also relating to trauma from our history, right? In our bodies. Uh, and and just curious if you can talk a little bit about the excavation process of, you know, we could be mindful in the moment and really practice and work with all this coming at us directly in our face. But then the excavation process of our childhood and then past generations and, and how to work with these imprints in our systems around what's been passed down yeah. and what we've learned. And, and um, what's, you know, what's the work there? What are we doing here? What, what's the work? Well, I think we'll all agree that the first step has to be the recognition that something with the way it is isn't quite right. So there has to be some kind of a wake-up call that warns us that whatever thing is going on needs to be examined. And so that wake-up call can be a mental health crisis. And and I'm sure that as psychiatrists, you've seen people who, as, as distressing and even um, well catastrophic a mental health crisis can show up as some years later or sometime later that person will look back and say boy I'm so glad that happened to me because I learned so much about myself and about how to live my life so there has to be this wake up before we start excavating. We have to learn that there's something there to be excavated, you know, and some guide has to how to deal with it. And uh, so that that wake up call is very often a mental health crisis. It could be a physical health crisis, an autoimmune disease, or a malignancy. <clears throat> it could be a relationship um, breakup or relationship challenge. Um, but there's to be something that instigates that, what you call the excavation process. Now, the second thing is just to realize that for all individual differences, for all the fact that we're very unique in our makeup and our histories and perspectives, there's something that we share in common. We share our humanity and and, and our humanity is a fairly reliable template for how to become a well-developed human being, and we have a template for how to subvert that template from developing in a healthy way. And that's, there's certain rules, you know, and, you know, Freud, who had all kinds of, I'd say, distorted, to say the least, ideas about human beings, but nevertheless, he was quite right about the power of the unconscious. And, and, And how so many of our behaviors don't reflect conscious beliefs or, and to the extent even which your conscious beliefs reflect unconscious dynamics so that the excavation has to be done precisely because this is unconscious, it's under the ground. And I think, I think what all three of us have learned perhaps is that you begin by 
first of all, make pe making people feel safe, that it's safe to engage in this exploration. It's not going to hurt them. It's going to help them. And secondly, there are certain questions that we can all ask that will guide people to look for that truth in themselves. So it has to begin with, A, some kind of a wake-up call, and secondly, some guidance, some safe guidance, some very safe context in which the excavation take, can take place. And thirdly, the trust that people do contain, they hold the truth within themselves if only we can just ask them the right questions in a safe enough way that they can face the truth of their existence. I'm reflecting as you're speaking about the wake up call, Gabor, um, on a time in my life where I was very deep in uh, a Tibetan Buddhist community and practice and studying with a teacher. And I was uh, incredibly, you know, as you can imagine, I was very ambitious in my meditation. Yeah. Uh, I remember thinking I was going to get enlightened in one lifetime <laughs> if I worked hard enough in meditation. Yeah. And yet, every time I stood up from the cushion, I was an absolute disaster in my marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, this was right before I met you, maybe 15 years ago, I um, was invited to an ayahuasca ceremony and, by one of the members of the Buddhist community. And um, it happened to be the night before Mother's Day, and mm -hmm. the uh, Peruvian shaman um, opened this incredibly beautiful, incredibly long prayer about the mother and his mother, all the mothers, the earth mother, mm. um, all the sacrifices that mothers make for us on our behalf, mm. how dependent we are on our mothers. And yes. it cracked something open in me that started, I think, to melt me in a way that ordinary therapy or the kind of therapy I'd been involved in, which I still go to. I mean, I, I still believe in, and, you know, yeah. I'll be seeing my therapist later this week. Uh, but the, the way that a uh, ceremony with an opening into the unconscious sometimes can get to a level that our healing technologies in North America or, you know, traditionally Freudian, um, you know, that the Western psychology tradition sometimes I would say never can get to certain things, especially for people like me with really strong ego defenses and coping strategies. Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess it's just a, an introduction to the question for you of, you spoke in your book about um, being in your forties and being very ambitious, successful physician and um, feeling somewhat maybe um, not in retrospect, not being the kind of parent that you maybe would have liked to have been at the time, but what, what was the, what was the call? What was the wake up uh, for you? If there was one or a series of experiences in, in that time in your life that, that um, led you to go in a different direction? Well, um, I'm kind of a slow learner, you know, so a lot of things had to go wrong for me to, start waking up um look i was successful i wasn't happy when i read my diaries i sort of as an add person i kept very fitful diaries and very occasionally and in spasms you might say but common theme is how depressed i am and how frustrated i am by my life how i feel i have potentials i haven't begun to tap i didn't know what they were uh but somehow i wasn't reaching anywhere near what i was meant to be here for my children were afraid of me on weekends when I wasn't working, I was sort of restless and listless and typical addict going through withdrawal, actually. Uh, and my marriage with this woman that I absolutely love was just so difficult and we were hurting each other so much. So um, that was the cumulative wake-up call. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, sometimes, yeah. And sometimes, you know, if you're lucky enough, you achieve success. So people who never achieve success, they keep thinking, if only I did, I'd be happy. But people who achieve success are in a sense fortunate because they can find out 
just so achieving success doesn't change anything for you at all. That, that, that inner emptiness is not any... Honest to God, I was talking to an NBA, I won't mention names, I was talking to an NBA star a few months ago, and they told me that they'd reached, they'd gained the NBA championship. And they thought if only I was a champion and had that ring, I'd be satisfied. No, the emptiness did not go away. So sometimes success is a good teacher because you it teaches you, you thought, what you thought was success doesn't get you any closer to yourself or to real being alive. So I suppose it was my success that was my teacher. Yeah, in some ways, success, I mean, if I speak for myself, outward success has allowed me to bump up against myself more yeah. in a daily way. Right. Um, there's just more and more material of like, wait, but now I can find this that I'm not happy about, or yeah. now I can find that that I'm not happy about. Um, and and I, I agree there that, you know, this kind of age old saying like, you know, money doesn't buy happiness or success, like whatever your version of success, it, it's not going to fill that void. But that's but that's just the toxicity of the culture, which keeps telling you that if only if you achieve this, attain that, uh, obtain that, you'll be okay, you'll be happy. And the whole ideo ideology of the pursuit of happiness, like it's out there somewhere, you keep running after it, maybe you'll catch up with it someday. Well, that's a toxic belief. But... A, a consumer's materialistic culture can't help but inculcate that ideology into its members. And no wonder. No wonder and there's you, so much suffering. And, 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 talk and, and, about... and, this is, and this is in the face of all the evidence, because how many people have we seen utterly successful, adulated by millions, kill themselves? But we keep thinking, if only more, you know? Yeah, and I, I think for me... I'm curious what you would say, because you talked too about the difference between healing and cure in your in the last number of chapters and, and healing being a path that actually will bring yeah. fulfillment and there is no cure, there's no touchdown. And um, you know, I, I'm curious because I think for me, um the aspect of success that has fulfilled me is actually just about being able to um feel that I'm in service in a way that is fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and as I see the evidence of that coming true in larger and larger voids, that's fulfilling to me. Um, and then, um, so I'm just curious for you, um, because you've had a very successful career, you know, what what has been fulfilling for you? What what? How are you doing right now in terms of this pursuit of stabilization or fulfillment and and like what have you learned here about what's actually helping you get well well how am i doing right now is always a daily question isn't it you know i mean i i can't give you a global answer but um <clears throat> i'm not nearly as driven as i used to be um i mean honest to god here i am on the very day that this book is being published and uh, um, I'm taking it rather in my stride. It's just one more day, really. And uh, I've done the work, you know, and the rest of it is up for this book to do out there. It'll do what it'll do. Uh, naturally, I'd like it to be a big success as a cultural phenomenon. And, but if it isn't, you know, it doesn't reflect on me. And and part of my problem in writing the book, actually, at a certain point, well, you talked about seeing a therapist. You know how desperate I got at one point writing this book? I actually saw a therapist. <laughs> how desperate can you get? You know, uh, I was writing this book about the wisdom of drama, and you know, and, and but and and the reason was, what I had to learn was, I was in a panic. I'm, I'm no kidding. My blood pressure was going up, and my blood pressure is normal. It's really good. But I was so identified with the book, there was no space between myself and the book. So that if the book, if, if the writing was stuck, then I was stuck. And if, the, if, and if the book wouldn't be the success that I had envisioned for it, then I'm not a success. And intellectually, I knew better. 
or an emotional level I was still so identified so that the therapy really helped me just to disidentify okay I'm doing the book it's a service to the world and it's also just an expression of what it need in me needs to be said but the book is not me and so now here it is and whether it succeeds in that external sense or not I won't be any more or less satisfied with my life or with myself because that contentment has it can only come from within and it can only come from the thing that you touched upon Keith it's 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 have I done what I can to help others you know in other words to be a part of humanity and that doesn't depend on how successful this book is you know so yeah and I'd say you know what at this stage I have. Now, Peter Levine, you, you might remember this conversation on the book with Peter Levine, and Peter Levine says, he's 80 now. It's just a little bit older than me. And he asks himself, have I done enough? And he says, yes. And then he says, then I ask myself, am I enough? And I saw Peter in Zurich just a few months ago. We we're doing some work together. And I said, Peter, have you answered that question yet? Are you enough? He said, I'm still working on it. But you know what? Intellectually, at least, intellectually, I can tell you, that's an unanswerable question. Because who's asking it? Who's asking, am I enough? Only some part of you that believes that you may not be. Right. So that it's, that question itself, I'll tell Peter next time I talk to him, comes from our wounded egos. <laughs> you know? So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable with who this person is than I used to be. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of uh, this tension that you outline in the book between for infants and for all across the whole lifespan of between authenticity and detachment. Yeah. And, you know, it sounds like what I'm, like what I'm hearing you say is that there's an authenticity that has come forward uh, in you that the book represents is a fruition of, of, of your authenticity of your voice that um, it, in some ways it's kind of irrelevant uh, what, what the book does because uh, it's not you. Yeah. You've you've listened to the call and you've produced the work and then you, as Nietzsche would say, you throw the golden ball and then you don't know what happens to it after that. Yes. That, that's how I feel about it. It's mm -hmm. done. And it's as close to authentic as I could be as I was writing it. I, I think the authenticity is there's more layers. I'm sure that I'll discover it depending on how much time I have left, you know, but it, to, to this point, it's that book is as authentically as I can say what I've seen and experienced and learned about the world and myself and other human beings. And so uh, I have to be, I am content with that. Hmm. Beautiful. I want to circle back to uh, the sources of trauma and mm the trauma of history versus the trauma of the present that we're versus to. The, the trauma of the present, but yeah. talking about the trauma of our history. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you reveal in many books, your childhood and you talk a little more about it in this book. Um, and, and I saw in the book, Bessel says to you at some point at a yeah. restaurant table why you don't have to bring Auschwitz with you everywhere you go or something yeah we're at Omega in New York uh, at Omega retreat, okay and we're having lunch and he says the Gabo yeah. he says you know what Gabo you don't have to drag Auschwitz around with you everywhere you go you know I don't know yeah. Dutch accent very well but that's how he said it and um, I intellectually got it but it didn't fully penetrate till years later as a matter of fact uh, about a year and a half ago, I was participating in a psychedelic ceremony with psilocybin. And I wrote Bessel afterwards. And I said, Bessel, I finally got what you meant. Which is that it was in the, under the effect of psilocybin. And I got that. <clears throat> now, that wasn't the first time that message was driven home to me, but I really... It, it took layers for me to understand it. But everything that could have happened, yes, my grandparents died in Auschwitz. Yes, I almost died in Auschwitz myself. Yes, my mother gave me to a stranger and I didn't see her and I 
interpret that as abandonment because I wasn't lovable. It, all that happened. None of, the, none of that needs to de de uh, determine how I am in the present. None of that needs to determine how I see the world. Um, none of that have to determine how I experience myself in this world. Which is what I mean about trauma being the wound that we sustain. Trauma is not what happened to us. It's the wound that we sustain and that can be healed. And not having to dr drag an Auschwitz determined perspective around with me. You know, and the funny thing, of course, was that intellectually, as a healer, I've, my work is all about we don't have to be stuck in the past. And I've helped so many people liberate themselves from the past. But myself, it took something, including those words of Bessel, including that mushroom experience, and including other experiences as well. well do, do you mind saying a little about what happened in the mushroom experience that it helped you shift your relationship another layer? Oh, just a downloading. I just forget it. And a year later, which is to say this March, I did another mushroom experience with some indigenous people in British Columbia. And as well knows, because we've sat in ceremony together, I have a very thick skull. It takes a long, it takes a lot to get through to this little brain, you know, and uh, it's very defended, you know. So I took a fairly high dose of mushrooms and um, with these indigenous people with their deep sorrow and suffering. And I actually experienced self-love. And if you ask me what that means, it's not words. It's it's our, it's, it's impossible to put in the words because it was an experience. But it was just that here I am, and that's all, and that's all there needs to be. It does not have to be any different. Yeah, I'm struck too by thanks for sharing all that. Um, Will and I had an episode recently where we went into intergenerational trauma a little bit, and I shared a deep story about myself. And mm. I don't know if you remember, Gab, where I've talked about this a long time ago on this podcast about working through Holocaust intergenerational trauma myself. Um, mm -hmm. Or at least that was the frame that that's what that was. Um, maybe it was my childhood. I don't know. But but what actually helped me heal was as I went deeper and deeper into the narrative of intergenerational Holocaust trauma uh, and then went on a pilgrimage out to the camps and um, this this deep healing happened and it all started when i was 19 or 20 i had an lst experience and i'm with friends and i'm just see start seeing swastikas everywhere and i'm mm -hmm. coming at me like ninja stars and cutting me up and i'm having this massive internal experience and and i'm just really struck that you know we all have these sort of holograms of history that are we're relating to yes and often we don't know it right? We're walking around. Yeah. Most people are not at all able to contextualize yeah. that energy that's in them, whatever that energy is. Um, and so I'm just struck by this, this journey of healing. And, and, you know, I think a part of the work we, we have our, we have our biological years of healing, and then we have our historical years of healing. And a part of the work is sort of facing the ghosts right of our past and um even though for me i have the opposite of you i'm my density i don't have density so i in ayahuasca i'm so psychically overwhelmed i feel yeah. like i'm being in a yeah. psychotic torture state uh -huh. um but you know i came to work with that as some of the jewish um damage that Jewish people have faced. And, and, and there was a lot of healing there for me of just the, the psychic annihilation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, this is, I guess what I'm, I don't know where I'm going with this other than saying back, like, well, let me, let, 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 me, yeah. let, me interrupt, let me interrupt Kurt, a uh, key yeah. story and take it somewhere. What, what comes to mind as you're describing your experience is how much we've lost by the loss of myth. I mean, genuine myth. I don't mean the myth, in a sense, it was a false narrative, but myth is an actual mm, metaphoric relationship to the psychic world mm -hmm. and elders and ceremony, all of which 
provided a space for all this. And if you talk to indigenous people, they're forever communing with their ancestors. So yeah. the healing happens on, on a multi-generational level. So we're so challenged in this modern stir our world by what we've lost. I mean, we've gained so right. much in terms of scientific knowledge and experience and technology. I mean, that's not to be disputed or to be dismissed, but we've lost so much as human beings. Yeah, we thank you for saying that. We have lost a lot in reduction reductionistic views of reality. Yeah. Um, and losing connection to the magical. I mean, some people might take that to the opposite end of the spectrum and be overly magical, but we've lost connection to the magical and to the, you know, I'll finish with one of the culminations and it's not done other as like, obviously there's more layers, but this is not a piece I'm actively needing to work on in the moment. One of the culminations of this intergenerational work was I, I had a ketamine therapy session years ago. And in the middle of the session, all of a sudden I saw a million Jewish people and they all put their hands up and were going like, the, you know, waving their hands at me with two hands saying, you've got this now. You don't need to hold mm. this anymore. Mm. Mm. And it felt like it, it was the first time where I really had a moment where I got like, oh, that's communicating with your ancestors. Yeah. Now, I don't know who the, uh -huh. what that was, or, uh -huh. but like there was a communication of ancestry yeah. where mm -hmm. my ancestry was behind my success and behind my healing. And, um, you know, that happened to be in a psychedelic medicine session. And yeah. you know, I think that's the power of psychedelic medicine that we can go there sometimes a little easier than without it. But um, I think this is, uh, I'm just glad you brought up this ancestry piece and ancestral healing and indigenous ways. And I think we can be in an, in an overly scientific reductionistic world. We can lose touch of ways of healing that we, we need and, and, and ways of communication that we need to heal. Yeah. In, um, in the book, I talk about indigenous ways, um, my limited exposure to them, but rich exposure. Um, and being in a sweat lodge. Have you have you guys been in a sweat lodge? Yes. Yeah. So they, you know, they bring in these hot rocks and they call them, now we're going to bring in the grandmothers and the grandfathers. And you think, what are they talking about? Or what they're talking about is, don't we all come from the earth? The same as those rocks. And I mean, talk about, imagine being in that kind of a relationship with the whole universe. Where the rocks are your grandmothers and your grandfathers, which they literally are, scientifically speaking. And yeah, if we could only be, if you could only combine Western wizardry and technology and science with some of these deep, deeply wise indigenous teachings, what a world we could have! If that could happen to medicine, not without not giving up any any of our advances in our incredible scientific achievements, but combine it with this holistic mind-body unity, the world is all one, which incidentally is as scientific as it gets, only that we don't study that science. So if you combine the science of oneness with the indigenous understanding of it with the technological achievements, we could have such a rich healing medical system. Mm. Agreed. Yeah. I think I think that's our task, is that integration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm an optimist sometimes, certain days. And in this moment, I'm an optimist. And I, I kind of see it as, you know, I left home when I was young and I kind of was like, I'm not going to, yeah. you know, relate to my parents right now as much. And it was sort of like that, you know, the science has sort of been like, we got to go over here and not relate to what was, you know, before. And, but I'm an optimist that we, we, we come together and we transcend and include over time uh, as we evolve. And so I'm an optimist that we'll find our way one day, but it might not be in the near future. Um, it's probably you know, not in the near future. If, if, if we weren't optimists, none of the three of us would be doing any of the work that we're doing. I mean, we must believe that some value to this is going to have some positive consequence. It already is, you know, and I'm thinking we can all see that. Yes, yeah, so I think 
even on the bad days, I think we're probably optimists because we carry on, don't we? Right. Agreed. Well, uh, we're getting, we're a little over our time here in Gabor with you and I want to really thank you. It's a really busy time for you. And we're so excited for this book to come out. Um, for our listeners, I want to say Keith and I were given uh, access, advanced access to the book and we've read it. We love it. We really recommend it. Uh, it's essential reading. And um, we just want to thank you, Gabor, for, for being an elder in, uh, in, in the truest sense, um, uh, being willing to say what's uh, uncomfortable sometimes to hear. And, um, and we, we also, often we, we end our episodes with an invitation for a guest to, uh, if you had one statement that you could put on a billboard that everyone would hear in their lifetime, just first thought, best thought, what would be your, your message to the people? What immediately comes to mind is the quote that I borrowed from my teacher, A. Chalmers, where he says that uh, being yourself is your greatest gift to mankind. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thanks, Gabor, so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I, really appreciate you. The, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you again. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much.